with her. I'll be in here. Quiet now. I'm recording. Hello. Tick here. <clears throat> you, my friend, well, if you're an evildoer, cover your ears. Because you are listening to the Canned Air Podcast, which is nothing but Keen Spoon! All right, Arthur, you can come out now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Canned Air, your tribute to comics and pop culture. I am Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. And I'm Randy Harder. And joining us today, very special guest today, and this guy's got so many awards, like, I, I, I don't know where he keeps them, he probably has to have a separate house, winner of 80 National Film Festival Awards, including Best Cinematography, Best Editing, Best Commercials to Documentary Short, and Best Music Video, and as of today, won the Gold Star Movie Award for Best Ad Film. I mean, where does it end with this guy? We welcome producer, director, cinematographer, and editor, Paul Brano to the show. Paul, thank you so much for being here, man. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It's uh, anytime something like this comes up, it's uh, it's not only honoring, but uh, it's humbling as well because you don't feel like you're all that big, big of a shot, you know, because you're not in L.A. You're, you're not in New York. You're just a one man band doing it. But it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you guys. You know, it's so funny how the industry has evolved with uh, digital media and the internet, and uh, even now with COVID, uh, you know, you don't have to be in LA. You can, you can be anywhere. You can be anywhere and, and make magic happen. That's the beauty of it. Well, yeah, that's the, uh, the funny thing that, uh, you know, years ago when I was dreaming of being a cinematographer and director, you had to go to Hollywood, you had to be in the union, you had to move out there, and you had to, like, know somebody. And with the... DSLR revolution, it seems like now everybody can be, which is good and also really bad because now everybody can do it. Oh, that's true. And I thought uh, there's always a downside to it because I was at, uh, I walked into a business in my hometown. I said, I'd love to talk to you about doing some ads for your Facebook page. He goes, oh, my, my cousin does that with a, with his cell phone. We're good. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> but I didn't want to insult them, that kind of thing. And I thought, I get it. You know, they're going to yeah. just going to have their, uh, they, you know, you can buy a drone for a thousand bucks. You can buy a DSLR high definition camera for, you know, 2000 bucks. Yeah. And years ago, 50, 60 grand. And yeah. that's just a body alone. And I thought, wow, times sure have changed for the better and for the worse. It's amazing what some of these YouTubers are able to pull off. I, I mean, and some of them are just kids and their production is crazy. But anyway, we'll, yeah. we are going to focus on that a little bit later. We're going to kick the episode off talking about our favorite PSAs in our retro round table. And uh, Randy suggested this last week, and I was uh, I'm I'm struggling at first, but it was one of those things that as soon as you take the cork out, this idea yeah. is just come a-flowing. It's the so. same with me, too. I'm excited <laughs> to talk about this. Excited to talk about that. And then we're going to turn our attention over to Paul and talk more about his amazing career. But before we do all that, don't forget to find us on Twitter at CandairPod and on Instagram at Canned underscore Air. And if you like what we're doing, head over to CandairPodcast.com. If you'd like to support the show, <laughs> You can get merch and be, uh, become a patron on that website. $5 a month gets you access to the Canned Air Patreon pod. A show you can only get over there, a show we just uh, finished recording before we started this episode, yep. and I thought that was another home run. You know, there are some really good episodes on there, and it's, it's just real loose formatting, mm-hmm. and it's 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 fun. Yeah, I'll stop shining my nails on my <laughs> collar here, but uh, I, was, I thought it came out pretty good anyway. Uh, what, what else we got, Randy? So if you're sitting around not doing much on a typically Tuesday night. Uh, check out Jack and I as we play Jackbox games on Facebook, uh, Twitch, and YouTube. Uh, join in the fun. Mm-hmm. Hang out with us. Listen to Jack and I make total idiots of ourselves. And if you are doing something, change the books. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be if you've got the time. If you do have plans, change them. Make a point to be at the Jack and Randy show. At the, I'm sorry, what was it? The, what do you <laughs> we don't it? really have a Jack, Jack and Randy. <laughs> Jack and Randy's Jackbox. But, uh, That's what we're going to call it this week. Welcome to the Jack and Randy show. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, let's kick off this week's Retro Roundtable. It's showtime. Got it, dude. Spared no expense. <laughs> All right, our favorite PSAs. How about Jack kicks us off this week? There we go. <laughs> so there's one that 
I was when I was searching through that I came across it was a a uh, an old pollution one and it's <laughs> it's kind of heart-wrenching watching it but at the end it just leaves I don't know it it just maybe it's the cynic in me that just makes me start cracking up but it's an old old uh American Indian walking around mm-hmm. Oh, seeing yeah. all the, the, like, the trash PSA. getting thrown out yep. everywhere. Yeah. I don't the, remember the that. Ocean. And then it, but at the very end, it shows him, and it just, it's a profile of him, and it zooms in on his face, and then he turns and looks at the camera, and there's just a single tear <laughs> dropping yeah. it. And it's so funny watching it, but it, I mean, at the same time, it's just like, God, we're so horrible. But <laughs> That's why you're on the show, Jack. I appreciate that about you. But yeah, that 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 camera did close up a little bit too close. On my... But I, if they didn't, with the film resolution at the time, you probably wouldn't have seen the tear, right? I right, mean, exactly. you, it was kind of yeah, necessity. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's yeah. Like the biggest tear, too. It's all ungodly huge. Well, he was fucking sad. Did you see how much trash was on the ground? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just blame the white man to hell with it. <laughs> That's what it is. Episode I mean, title, boys. <laughs> yeah. Seems to be working that, for everyone that, else. Uh, <laughs> that guy was Iron Eyes Cody. That's the guy's name is Iron Eyes Cody. Was the Indian in, in the uh, commercial? Oh no, is shit. it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, not shooting film, but I remember watching all these TV series growing up. How it influenced me now. And every one of those was either done in 16 or 35 millimeter film, and they had right. camera crews done like they do now. And that, I mean, I still remember seeing that ad a lot. Not a ton of PSAs, but enough. And I thought, I just feel like crap. I'm a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. you, but you know where they shot it? Probably in California. And California is no better than it was today, back then, you know? Oh, absolutely. No. We should feel bad. You don't have any idea how privileged we are. Now, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but was not Iron Eyes Cody, and I may be thinking of something weird, but wasn't he originally from Japan or something like that? I don't think so. I think he was just a, because uh, I've got him actually up here on my cell phone, and he was actually born in Louisiana. And the and the weird thing was, is the Wikipedia says he was an Italian-American actor. Okay, that's what really? it was. I knew he was, he was yeah. not Native American. No, because back then, and I was just watching, uh, I think over the holidays, on my TV, I got to watch some old uh, Western movies way back then and how horrifically offensive they were looking at them with the 2021st point of view. Mm-hmm. Right. And almost every one of them was painted down. They talked and, you know, how and all that other. Wow. Uh, pl- all the other stuff they get, would get them sued now. They would never make that now. Sure. And I thought, wow, how did they get away with this? And I thought, well, money and political influence and all that other stuff. But nobody was thinking about that. They just said money mm, and right. we can make it. And, it, and I was watching all this from Ch- Charles Bronson played Indian because he looked like one. That's, but if you oh look like, like, even, well, like in, even in the, um, not a PSA, but the uh, TV series Yellowstone that I'm a huge addict for because it's uh, it's actually photographed and shot in Montana in the Bozeman area. And that's where I went to film school. Oh, that's awesome. So it's awesome. And Monica, who plays one of the characters, I think her name is Kelsey as Billy or as Bill. Anyway, she's supposed to be being Native American. Well, she's Japanese wow. or Chinese. Okay, maybe that's But she looks like a Native. Lost. Yeah, and to me, it's just I love her. I mean, she's a great character, but I thought, I believe it. If I watch it, I believe it because she looks like it and so forth. And I thought, yeah, yeah she, I think her father's Japanese or Chinese. Okay. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. I would have never guessed. I mean, he, he looked like he was full-blooded Native mm-hmm. American. Like, Wow. Wow, it's in you know I can't think of a single PSA that probably lasted longer than that one because I think that one started in the seventies, went through the eighties, and I remember even in the nineties, uh, Nick at Night would play like yeah, retro yeah. commercials mm-hmm. uh, between their right. retro shows, right. and I remember seeing it then, too. Um, yeah, and I've uh, and I haven't because when I think of a PSA, I haven't really thought of anything that stands out in my mind now because not a lot of people are doing PSAs, right? No. And I, Unless I find one on YouTube, because on YouTube, years ago, this is when MTV used to play music, and now it's just <laughs> crap. Yeah. <laughs> they should say CTV, but that's a whole other issue right there, is CTV. But uh, they were playing every music video that I ever invented because v- uh, MTV stopped playing them. Now YouTube, you can go and find any PSA you ever wanted to. And I thought, this is great just to look back and see how either good they are or how horrifically bad they are. <laughs> it's interesting. It really is uh, the history of the PSA. Because when I was looking on uh, YouTube at some, it seemed like for a while there they, you know, were trying to hold some real moral ground, make a difference. And <laughs> it seems like over time, 
they kind of became a joke joke like especially like on nbc like oh yeah the more you, you guys remember oh, the yeah. more you know, you know. Oh, yeah that was like the last the last dregs of PSAs. They don't even do those anymore that I know of. Well, I, I think you're right. I don't know. I don't have a network television anymore. Mm. I haven't seen it for some time, and I don't know if they are or not. But, um, you know, looking at the more you know is like on YouTube, like through the 80s, through the 90s. Again, it seemed like they had a pretty strong objective. We need to get people to care about their kids, need to get kids to stay in school and away from drugs. It seemed to be, you know, the, the main objective of all those PSAs, but then I saw some that had um, people from the office, like Pam and Dwight, and I was like, were they really still doing those at that time? And I, <laughs> so I clicked on them, and they were just bullshit. It was just them saying <laughs> stupid stuff, like as a promo for the show. But at the, at the end, still that same more you know come <clears> in, and I thought, man, that's kind of deceiving, isn't it? A yeah. Bit? Well, it's interesting when you look back at those because I remember it was some actor. I think Eric Stoltz was in a. No, no, I'm sorry. It was Eric Stoltz, and it was another woman, Victoria. She was on Saturday Night Live in the 80s, and she did a commercial, and I thought, some of these actors, and it's like their first job, and that's how they're going to get their SAG card, so they'll do a PSA just because they're being paid. They don't care what the deal is. They just want to get paid. So I thought, I know Steve Carell was in, I think, a Burger King ad. Right, he was. Mm. And I thought, all these other actors are in PSAs, and I thought, these are good because you have somebody who is probably an Oscar-winning cinematographer shooting this, so of course you want to do it. You right. want to make somebody look really, really good. And I thought, it doesn't surprise me anymore, except if, a, if, a, uh, if an actor does porn. I thought, <laughs> yeah, it's still, it's still sketchy, but he won the Oscar last year, you know, that type of thing. And I thought, well, everybody's... <laughs> I was listening to a, uh, an interview with Wally Pfister, and Wally Pfister is the cinematographer of the Batman trilogy with Christopher Nolan. Oh, wow. And I was listening to him because he left and he went on to direct. And he said, one of my careers, one of my career choices early on was commercials and so forth. And they were called erotic thrillers. They were like high end porn films, but they weren't. They were like Playboy features. Okay. That's why they call it erotic thrillers. And I thought, OK, <laughs> so I'm not going to judge you. You're working. Why? What the hell? You know, that that's was, how we got to know, like, it's Christopher Nolan. They played a lot of those like on HBO, like after eight o'clock. Right. Wasn't that kind of the. Yep. That was the because uh, I was watching them. Um, God, this is just before I joined the Air Force way back in 1988 ish. Uh, Andy Sedaris was the guy making them and they weren't they weren't adult adult, but they were like watching Playboy long feature videos because they had, you know, full, you know, the bodies of the women and the men. But it wasn't categorically adult adult but it kind of was it was more gotcha. tastefully done i right. thought got it that's kind of the difference and i thought still i liked it right. <laughs> it's like, it just didn't show penetration is yeah. what we're getting at right i mean <laughs> like, you saw like, the like, naked people but you didn't see any yep. details it wasn't like a it wasn't like a violent medical video it wasn't like that so <laughs> it's it's funny i used to uh work at a, a record store you know late 90s early 2000s and vhs was still you know, a uh, thing. Right, right. DVD was just coming in, and we had a whole section uh, at the back of the store that was nothing but those Playboy videos, <laughs> those you know, soft core things. <laughs> and we had to keep people back there all the time because people were stealing them. All the freaking, it was like the the most stolen thing in the store were those tapes. I'm like, why are you yeah. keeping them in the back corner of the store? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, too, because I remember a VHS myself going to all those, and you feel like you're doing something naughty because you're still like that young age to where it's like if you look at a Playboy, you have to look at it really quietly because even though you may be reading an article, it's still Playboy. Yeah. And I remember seeing all these videos that were like that same style with, uh, oh, it was the actress was Tracy Scoggins, and she was in a video and it was a very well done because I looked at the IMBD page on it and I thought, I need to know what this video was because this is way back when I still remember it. Well, the actor Mark Singer was the lead and he had come from Beastmaster, all these movies of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was really a good looking film, but it really didn't have much of a plot to it. And the big <laughs> and the big deal was that she was getting undressed and she was in her bra and panties and she was dancing to this music, cutting back and forth with these guys who were going to assassinate the president. So, what the hell does this have to do with anything? Because <laughs> you don't really know. It's like, I'm going to continue to watch because she's dancing in her underwear. The hell of it. But it was that style of movie that did not change for like two or three years. Right. And they were making tons of them. Yeah. And they would uh, have deals on the back like a PSA for don't smoke or don't have sex or whatever the stupid <laughs> thing is just to keep their butts legally 
done or whatever. I thought it was just funny because <laughs> just a last minute who the hell's making a movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and some, and some very famous people were working on it back then because it was like their first job. Crazy, that was incredible. Interesting, interesting. Again, how the times change, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Paul, what about you? A favorite PSA? Oh gosh, when I was trying to figure out because I've been kind of busy doing some uh, some family stuff down here, mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to look up a PSA that was my favorite, but I couldn't think of one except one that I actually did. But it was a local. I was crew on one, and we were. I was living in Houston, Texas, and worked for Time Warner at the time, and we were meeting everybody that was famous to Texas, like the mayor, the governor, um, the um, coach of the uh, Houston Texans, because the Houston Texans football team had just formed the first two years that I was there. So it was a big, big deal. And I got to meet um, some famous guys. One was the mayor of the town. It was just a small PSA that I was a grip and lighting guy on. And I'll always remember that because it was started off as black and white. And this is in the days of uh, Beta SP, four by three. So none of it was, but it was just so fun being, you know, with four or five crew members on a shoot. And it's the only PSA that I can think of off the top of my head, except Iron Ice Cody, because I haven't really seen a lot that like, you know, it, it, you know, it's off the top of my head. Right. So I thought Iron Ice Cody is the most famous one. So I know everybody can actually relate to it, except some of these millennials who have no idea who he is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that's one that comes. But it was a local spot. And I just distinctly remember a PSA. And another one I did was a guy. He was dressed. This is stuff I've made. I haven't seen a lot of them lately. But he was walking down the street and he puts his hands in his pocket and it's for depression. And we did it all black and white, tilt of the camera, Dutch angle, and he was walking across. And I thought, this is depressing as hell. But I thought, the message is there. Then we went to a color, you know, uh, screen graphic, and it made you feel better. I thought, well, at least it's good, and everybody <laughs> loved it. And I thought, making one is much, much different than watching one because of the emotional deal to it. Because I thought, this is the best commercial ever because I made it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> good enough <laughs> reason. Right. Yeah. And I thought it's interesting when you watch that because what type of message are you give, are, are you sending out that people will react to? And now with social media, it's like everything's on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. nobody's nobody's doing them anymore because everybody's you know I mean it's going to take over Facebook. So I'm hoping I actually produce one lately, but I haven't found anything recently except maybe you guys maybe spark my memory about one I've seen. <laughs> I'm sure we have a few here yeah. that are going to jog your yeah. memory. Uh, Randy, do you yeah. want to dry next? So I, I've got a few that spark my memory. But the first one I want to talk about is um, I was, as you guys were, I was on YouTube doing some research and uh, found one. Uh, of course, Reagan era war on drugs. Oh uh, yeah, starring Mr. T. Um, it Made opens. Who do drugs? <clears throat> he's he's literally sitting in a diner and he turns left to the camera. He's eating or something. He has a coffee mug in his hand. And he's like. People, when people take drugs, I get real mad. He, like, crushes the coffee cup, right? And he starts walking <laughs> towards the camera, and he's like, you know, I, it makes me real mad when the kids fool, and they, the kids, they do each other drugs, and you literally see him reach out and start, like, strangling the camera, and he's shaking it back and forth, like, I don't like when kids do drugs, so kids don't do drugs. So it was like the original voter die. Uh, something like that. But you see, like, <laughs> yeah, the camera's, yeah. like, he's, like, choking the, the camera out, and, you know, you see it, like, start falling back, and all these diners are, like, sticking their head over Mr. T, like, what the hell's going on? And at the very end, he, like, lets go, and he smiles. And he's like, don't do drugs, kids. I'm like, well, no shit, they're not going to do drugs. They're not going in any diners <laughs> now, <laughs> either. Gee, <laughs> me. I, I mean, don't want to go in there. Mr. T's in there. You <laughs> choke me. I, I mean, I've never seen a commercial go from like zero to a thousand that quick. I'm going to have to watch that one. Yeah, it's hilarious. I mean, I well, knew he had done well, some, but I didn't know it was like that violent. I'm sorry, Paul, you were saying? No, I was going to say, the PSA makes me not want to be a cameraman. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to be strangled by some guy on Mohawk. My God, man. <laughs> Especially like he touched the camera, arms he touched as big me. as he had. I mean, it wouldn't take long. Would uh, yeah, it? he was like full on Clubber Lang, like all, right up oh, until yeah. the end, and then he does like this real like uh, oh yeah sweet smile, and it's just it's so jarring. <laughs> no, I've got to watch it. <laughs> yeah, well, Did you ever have... see the? Uh, oh my God! Now here's a this is a song slash PSA that Mr. T did. I see it every Mother's Day. The Mr. Tr T music video for Treat Your Mother Right. It's ringing somewhat of a bell. I can't. It's, it's yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, in the eighties, Mr. Doesn't T. Ring a bell. Mr. T <laughs> did a music video called "Treat Your Mother Right," all about respecting your mom. <laughs> nice. I strongly. You know what? No, I'm ending this episode with that song. Let me make a note of that really quick. Treat 
your mother, oh. right? Although there was one that I can think of that I actually happened to see by accident. <laughs> and I have to tell you because it's it's freaking brilliant. Because it was on Saturday Night Live. Oh, And man. it was, I think, when... Um, Oh god, what is it? I want to get this right. It was two guys hunting, and Affleck came out of the duck, okay. and they shoot the duck. <laughs> brought, to you, brought to you by the National Rifle Association. Nice. <laughs> so I thought, brilliant, just brilliant, because you could tell the duck was fake. Right. You could sure. just tell. And I, I think it was Jimmy Fallon, another guy, and they had the, uh, the you know, the uh, the red uh, safety gear on. Right. Yeah. And it. He went Aflac like this. So you think it's an Aflac ad. And then they're sitting there, it's like Aflac, and all of a sudden, boom, they don't they don't show him shooting the duck, but they show them shooting. And it's like this public service announcement brought to you by the National Rifle Association. <laughs> I thought, this is brilliant. <laughs> and it was when Aflac was doing tons of advertising. Every other commercial is an Aflac ad. Yeah. I, thought, I get that. That's funny. Yeah, before Gilbert Godfrey pissed everyone <laughs> off. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, he had the best joke I've ever heard in my life. Well, he says he was he was on a stand-up routine, and Gottfried said, "If masturbation was a crime, I'd be on death row." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's pretty good, actually. That's pretty good. I can't do impressions to save my life, but knowing he was he was, I think all these comics were. I just happened to see it on Comedy Central, but I thought he did. He would he would do a routine for like thirty minutes, and you just could not stop laughing because he doesn't do impressions, but he kind of does in his way, yeah. and they're still hysterical. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Makes me laugh every time. <laughs> uh, trying to think of a good one to mention here. Um, how about, does anybody cook eggs sunny side up without thinking, this is your brain, <laughs> brain on, on drugs? Brain. This is your brain <laughs> that was on one drugs. Of mine. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's well, another I, I like one scrambled that... eggs, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's even worse. This That's a different kind check. of drug, Paul. Yeah, egg beaters. I changed the name of that. You can't say beaters; it's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's one that uh, I just—I think almost any child that grew up anywhere in the '80s or '90s has to know, right? Well, that and I learned it from yep. you. That was the other one I had written down. Oh, I'm sorry, I, no, oh, you're fine. That, yeah, I right. forgot no, about that. I mean, they—they they kind of go hand in hand. I always wondered yeah. about that one, though. You know, from you, all right. I learned it from watching you. Is everyone here aware of what that yeah. is? Okay. Oh yeah. So it, yep. I always wondered if the dad had why he had you know decided to do drugs one, but two decided to do them in front of his kid. Like that just like I don't know. And that box was full of stuff. It wasn't just a bag of weed. I think there was bags of pills and everything in there. But was that the, so the kid stuff or the dad on. stuff? That's what I could never figure out. Because it seemed like that kid had one hell of a collection, and Dad right. was like putting in his face, like, "Where'd you get this? Where'd you get this? What's your dealer's name?" <laughs> yeah, really, he was kind of jealous. Give me his <laughs> number. I need him. I had you. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> How's my seven-year-old getting better shit than I can get? <laughs> I'm gonna talk That's to your. That always tonight. works. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that was in the '80s. I remember that too. Because yeah. if yeah. you look back at it, if you look back at that, you could tell the mullet. The style yes. of the '80s clothes, everything. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the worst time for fashion. Oh. The worst yeah. time. Actually, I loved it. I absolutely loved that era. Really? I don't know why. I just did because I look back at the '70s, which I hated. Oh, I get that. I hated the long hair because I I can't grow long hair. It's just impossible for me because of the shape of my head and everything else. But the bell bottoms, the monster collars. I mean, seriously, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, the Navy has that, and I was in the Air Force, and I thought they're looking back to the 1970s. But they said, "Well, when when you're out in sea and you're capsized, you can uh, tie up your legs, and they'll help you float. That's why they're bell bottoms." Uh, yeah. Oh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> Tell that to Woodstock; they'll really believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was ready for a flood back then. They were. <laughs> Man, I don't know. I, I that 80s fashion, like the like the the oversized suits, like Steve Harvey still rocking those oversized yeah. suits, isn't he? Yeah. Like the shoulder yeah, pads, <laughs> the, the 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 big 80s bands, like the dudes like dressed up like women for some reason. Like I don't understand why oh, that yeah. was like so manly. You know, it's a weird thing. I think it. Well, for me, um, I remember being. I remember the. Uh, I think it was either the first day or the first week that MTV was on the air. And every video they played uh, was from Britain because they're the only ones making them. Mm. And I thought I looked at the style and it was all copied from that, from what I understood, the spiked hair, the leather, the whole nine yards. Right. And you look at like 
you look at train spotting, that fashion with those in the 90s, you look at, I haven't seen Wonder Woman 84, but they sort of copied that same deal. And I thought, yep, you had the fanny pack, you had the uh, parachute pants, mm -hmm. you had the Union Jack because Def Leppard made it famous. Right, yep. right. I and think I remember I had in high school, everything he just named. <laughs> I, I, really did. I know if I didn't, my dad I did. did. Definitely number oh, one and two. One I definitely had. Man. I think it was back in 83, 84. I remember in high school, one of the guys that I knew, he had a mullet. He had the Union Jack uh, sweater thing, whatever you want to call it. And then he wore parachute pants every day of the week. Wow. Jeez. Now in the 80s? That's fucking cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, the mullet was cool, too, and I just, oh, God, please. I couldn't stand that hairstyle, but I looked at the 80s. It was colorful. It was bright. And I thought, I like this. And then the 90s came in and crushed everything else. Yeah. We need to be druggy <laughs> and dreary. Yep. I hate Old my mullet. life. I hate my life. Give me a job. I hate you. Give me a job. <laughs> what? What? Get me a flannel good old shirt and let party me rip in the rear. What, business in the go. front, party in the rear. <laughs> right. <laughs> there was this dude back home when I was, uh, I don't know, I graduated high school in 2000. I'd say I left the area around 2010. So 2010 is far too long to have been rocking a mullet. But there was this dude <laughs> yeah. who was running through town, not only rocking a mullet, it was a hell of a mullet, and he was proud of his mullet. And and the thing is, is he's not a dude who was from the era. Okay. He was younger than I was. Oh, jeez. He oh, just geez. liked the mullet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, like, this dude was the word on the street for a long time. Like, hey, have you seen so-and-so's fucking mullet? Like, it's getting bigger. Oh, jeez. When's he going to cut that shit? <laughs> I mean, hey, props for him for getting noticed. Eh, I don't know if you want to get noticed like that. I, I mean, just you, you park at the gas station, lean on your shitty truck, and think that you're uh, God's gift to women. It just doesn't work, no. Yeah. He hasn't been featured in any they, memes lately, has he? <laughs> none I've seen, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. So, who knows? Well, I remember just, there, was a, uh, there was a sitcom that came out after the mullet had gone away, because they were trying to bring it about, called The Mullets. Oh, and I think it was a two or three episode deal, and I think Lonnie Anderson was the actress. Oh my God! Really? And, it, and you you can you can look this up, and it lasted I think two or three episodes, and it was done because I thought, yeah, it's a stupid premise because everybody <laughs> wears. I think they're called the mullets. They have a mullet. And I thought this is not going to work. So not like, going to work. I didn't watch. Oh, it was like repelled me. It didn't want me. Didn't make me want to watch. It was the Coneheads minus imagination, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. But yeah. they got Lonnie Anderson, so they did something right, except a huge paycheck. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Was she? Uh, she was the one in uh, WKRP, right? Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 That was another good show. I remember that show really well. That yeah. was because uh, it was the night. God, what was it? Seventy nine, eighty, eighty one, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I really because it was a, such a great series because the casting was perfect. Yeah. And I thought you can't get better casting than this. And I think Lonnie Anderson was the only one who came out of that as the more famous one naturally. But Bailey and Mister uh, Herb Tarlick and all these other guys, I remember seeing this all the time. Yeah, Less and she didn't, Nesman. you know, for being Less the big Nesman. name yep. on that show, didn't get a lot of screen time compared to the others. No. Right, yep. But, but yeah. the, the, the thing is, when she did have a screen time, you stopped and watched. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was, it was documented every time she was on the screen. Yeah, I get that. Oh, yeah. Well, the odd thing was, is my, uh, my father actually sold radio and TV advertising my entire life. So it was like watching what he went through, yeah, because yeah, in a way it was true, because of this... I mean, if you've got a gorgeous woman there, you you have no idea how many men are going to show up. Salesmen, just like Herb Tarr, like just, you know, with their leisure suits or whatever the heck they had. And I thought, oh, this yeah. is just disgusting. It's funny <laughs> as shit, though. I can never remember uh, the, the the DJ's name, the main DJ that he always wore the big glasses. Uh, oh, that was uh, Johnny Fever, wasn't it? Yeah. Johnny Fever. Thank you. Howard, I, Howard Hessman. Always think of whenever I'm doing this show, sitting behind this microphone and stuff. I I, I think of him and Frazier doing his show at kind of at the same time. Oh, yeah. but we we did an uh, episode uh, where we played old vinyl records for the record door. Excuse me, record store day episode yeah. where I played a bunch of vinyl records, and boy was I fucking channeling him that day. I was like loving every minute of it. It's like this is just like WKRP. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Venus Fly Venus Flytrap was the uh, black guy. Yeah, Tim. Yes. Tim. Can't remember the guy's name, but it was him, Howard Hessman, and then Les Nespin, the news guy. And I thought, boy, I could really take apart each one of them and say, that's that guy, that's that guy, that's that. At yeah. any radio station, and that yeah. was what I was had growing up. They were all 
chain smokers and drinkers and womanizers. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> you have um, the office of radio. Yeah. Then he, uh, the uh, I can't remember the guy, the first guy you mentioned, uh, the black guy on the show. He was also Hyde. Tim Reed. Hyde's Tim dad Reed. then on uh, that 70s show. He came back oh, in as kind of like yeah. a 70s icon playing, you know. Gotcha. And uh, yep. was really good in that show, too. I enjoyed him. Well, the thing is, um, I, I was thinking about all that stuff, uh, uh, the 70s show, because Tanya Roberts just died over the weekend, and she was in that. Who was Tanya she? Roberts was on. She was in uh, Charlie's Angels. She was in A View to a Kill. Charlie's Angels, I think she replaced. Now, uh, who, who was she uh, on the 70s show? So she was, uh, oh, the the, uh, the redhead's mom. Oh, Donna's man, mom. bitch. Yep. Wow, man. she oh, died? Yep. Yep, she died over the weekend, and uh, I saw it. I saw it on a, a Facebook page of people who who are, I, I think, agents in the business, and they said, "No way, she was only sixty-five. Yeah, that's crazy. I was going to say, she thought, wow, she. And they were just playing a View to a Kill on this uh, TV that I'm watching. They have like 007 reruns on there, mm. and I thought, wow, I cannot believe because that was back in '85, wow. and she died at sixty-five. That is thought, nuts. Geez. Yeah, like the, it was January first. I think it came out. Oh, I actually, I don't think that. she did die. I'm up. seeing here, and it says it was a mistake that she is still alive. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so you what? can't. Re- you can't. Well, they, they, they announced it, it was a mistake, I guess. It's all I over the place. That... Yeah, they announced it on TMZ that she had passed away. Yeah, I'm looking at that TMZ right now. Partner explains why he thought she had died. <laughs> <laughs> no, nice. <laughs> Tanya, Stay if you're listening retracted. to us, we love you. Wow. Tanya, if you're out there and you're alive, we love you so very much. Yeah. <laughs> and boy, I mean, you talk about Lonnie Anderson when she came on screen. Holy cow. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I remember uh, Tanya Roberts on Beastmaster with uh, um, with uh, Mark Singer way back in Holy the crap, 80s. that was her. Yeah. Yep. Wow. I think she was brunette back then, and then she did, she did another thing, and I thought Beastmaster was so controversial back then because it was all these women. That. Yeah, it was interesting because I think it was just a cult hit. Mm-hmm. Huh. That movie's good. I watched that a couple months ago and loved every minute of it. Yep. A lot of these movies, I look back and I thought, why are they so? Why do the critics hate them? And I thought, who? I'm sorry, I don't care about the critics. I just, if I like it, I like it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember looking back at that and I thought, these, the, the special effects are bad. But this was the '80s. They, 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 don't, they didn't have CG. Everything was like practical. And I thought, but the story is so fantastic. It's great. I love it. Right. Man, that was a roller coaster yeah, right there. Well, wasn't that it? was awesome. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but she's alive. I'm, I'm, okay. seeming, seeming I've got alive. Wow. I'm going to Facebook friend her right now. <laughs> hey, I thought you were dead. <laughs> you just stop Second chances do you happen. <laughs> I'll, send my, uh, I'll send a text to uh, Facebook to uh, Tiny saying, I am a famous movie director, but nobody knows who I am. This is the <laughs> trick. And she says, stop emailing me. That's what I thought. <laughs> Well, with that behind us, let's put our attention over to Paul and talk about, again, his amazing career as a producer, director, cinematographer, editor. And if you look on IMDb, that list of credits keeps going, too. Mm -hmm. I just don't have enough breath. So where do we start with you, Paul? Where did you grow up? How did did you get into film? Uh, Gosh, it... uh... You always want a joke saying, I was born in a log cabin in 1860. It's like, well, that's a dumb old joke. Don't even go there. But I did anyway because I wanted to break the ice. Um, well, I grew up in uh, Minot, North Dakota. And a lot of people who are listening to this may or may not know of Minot because uh, there's an Air Force base just north of my hometown. I, I want to say about 30 miles or 30 minutes, one of those 30s. And tons of people have come and gone uh, through Minot. And it's um, not, North Dakota is not really a uh, tourism state, unfortunately. They kind of are sort of old school, but it's a place where you can raise your family. Kind of like Mayberry, you know, oh, you, wow, you know okay. with OB, you know. It's sort of like that because mm-hmm. when you go to a state where it's pr- primarily farming and agriculture, um, the biggest city is about 200,000 people. That's Fargo. The Coen brothers made that famous right. in the movie Fargo. But it wasn't shot in Fargo. So it was one of those, one of those branding names where... Um, film and video isn't really done uh, up there, except in the Fargo area. Bismarck is our state capital, Grand Forks and Minot. And it's not really done up there. And it was really hard because I fell in love with film early, like when I was like five or six. And I remember, if, if, and you all may remember this, but I grew up loving movies, TV. And since my father worked in radio and TV, I would go out there. My mother worked in education as a teacher. And then she started having a family, my brother and I. And then she began um, as a secretary or as an executive secretary, and she found work at a school. So she kind of was in education her entire life. 
my father was more of a business guy, but he got a, he got uh, a job at a TV and radio station. And when I would go and visit both my mom or dad doing errands or whatever I had to do, go pick them up for whatever reason, um, my father would always introduce me around to all the local famous people, which were the anchors and the reporters, everybody you see on TV every day, mm -hmm. which is kind of like now to this day, people still do it at you know NBC or CBS or whatever you want, because they're, I mean, the anchors are the heroes because you're inviting them into your room every every night, so you feel like you know them. And I was meeting these guys, and I remembered, I don't know when this was, but it was early when I was in like either late elementary, early high school. I went up to see my dad. And it was right after I got my license, so it was kind of nice to be able to go out there drive and not have to worry about anybody driving out there. But a door was open in the uh, station, and we just called it the station. And it was a local CBS station. And a door was open, and there was a bunch of lights in there. And the lights were kind of coming through, so my eye went right there. And I was captivated. I thought, what is it? And I walked in there. It was the studio where the cameras were and the anchors were. And I was just in, is this Hollywood? That's like my reaction. It was just blew me away because everybody I knew in school was either a bagging groceries, uh, worked in retail, mm -hmm. worked in construction. Nobody was doing what I wanted to do, like being a photographer or anything else. And I just was in love. I thought, this is what I want to do. And I knew really nothing about it except visually I was taken aback by it. And I thought, this is what I wanted to do. And I thought, how do I do this? What do I do? I mean, I was wanting to start my career at like 15 or 16. And this is like in the 80s and um, unlike today where you have social media you have everything right there on the computer um, I kind of joke I kind of joke when I say I didn't know where to go so I had to go to this building and this building had a bunch of books in it oh it was the library I actually went to a library and got the read. you know it was one of those things because I had to go do my research it right. wasn't at my it, I didn't have an iPad nothing like that mm -hmm. so I had to go and I was reading every, I was self teaching myself on photographic lighting on cinematography and I thought, wow, cinematography, that's a big word. And when I remember when I was in the uh, Air Force, the guy that I was working for, my senior airman, and I was an airman first class, so he was the, in charge of us. He says, Paul, you're going to be a, a what, what do you call it again? I said, cinematographer. He says, you a cinnamon photographer? I thought, no, I'm not going to record cinnamon. I said, that sounds like a great title. I'd love to be able to photograph cinnamon for a while. It would be tasty. But he couldn't say it. And I thought, okay, great. So I took that, and I thought, yep, this is what I want to do. And speaking of Frasier, when I was in the Air Force, I had been stationed overseas in Italy, and that's when I got my first taste of being overseas. When I came back, I was in San Antonio, and I was watching TV, and I skipped over a bunch of stuff of how I got into it, but I'll kind of go back into that here a little bit just because it's kind of cool now certain things are happening. But mm -hmm. I remember watching a TV show. Three guys were being interviewed about a movie that they were doing in San Antonio, and I thought, I have to go there. I have to, and this is before, this is 1991. I think it was 1990 or 1991, trying to figure out the time. But, yeah, it was 1991, and I had to take a taxi, didn't have a car, didn't have a cell phone, didn't have any of this stuff. So they were three guys were on uh, a morning show. turned out the guy's name was Ken Lampkin, and he was the director cinematographer. Well, he was the one that was doing this movie. I got to be at it. And remember the uh, TV series A-Team? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Until oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> the A-Team. <laughs> Dirk, ben Dirk Benedict was the star. Right. And Lance Legault, who was the guy chasing him on the A team, he was the bad guy. Decker? And I thought, I have to, this is like my childhood. I have to. So I wrote Ken a letter saying, This is who I am. I'm in the Air Force. I'm, I want to be a cinematographer. And I forgot about it. Two weeks later, Ken calls me at work and we talk for about 15 minutes about film. He says, I want you to come to set and work for about a day. And I thought, Where, when? I'll be there, you know. So I got to go and I saw Kerr, I saw all these just, it wasn't a la an elaborate production, but it, it sort of sent, and this is in the days of film, 35 millimeter film, digital wasn't out yet, but Ken had just come off the TV series Wings with um, Christopher Nard and Tim Daly. Right. And he was trying to do feature films in San Antonio and he was, for some reason the film came out, it didn't work out really well because it went straight to video and he went off to do Frasier right after that. Oh, man. And I thought, wow. And, it, and today I'm still in touch with his wife. And she's been loving all the awards that I've been given. And I thought, I can't thank anybody but two guys. And one of the guys, one of my heroes, I actually met because after the Air Force, I uh, went to film school in Montana at Montana State University in Bozeman. This is 20 years before Yellowstone. So I'm in there and I'm getting my degree in film and loving it. And who shows up but not Ken but a bunch of films were being shot in Montana, the Gallatin Valley, which is what they call it, um, during the course of my time there. 
Robert Redford came up and made the Horse Whisperer. Yeah, that's with Scarlett Johansson and Sam Neill. Mm -hmm. um, he had been there years before with A River Runs Through It, which, in which he got the Oscar, the fly fishing story with Brad Pitt. Okay, they had they had made it and they shot it on Montana State University campus. He came back to make the Horse Whisperer. And I got to see him walk across the alleyway, and I was a film student. I didn't want to bug him because I knew I'd probably get shot if I did, you know. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to go to class. <laughs> um, but I got to see the crew setting up a shot with him and uh, Kristen Scott Thomas. And later, I found out that Dennis Quaid was up making a modern day western east in Livingston, in Livingston, Paradise Valley. So I went there and saw him, and I got to see like a rodeo, um, I guess a rodeo scene that they were doing, but. What I wanted to see was, um, if you, you know the action star Steven Seagal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They were making all these announcements for our students to go on. And what I noticed wasn't Seagal, but I noticed the guy that was directing. His name is Dean Semler. And Dean Semler is an Australian cameraman who won the Oscar for Dances with Wolves. Okay. He did Mad Max, uh, Apocalypto, Mad Max 2 and 3. I mean, this guy is Mr. Legend in the Some Australian movies, industry. Yeah. I had seen dances when I was in the Air Force home on leave, and that made me want to be a cinematographer. Years ago, when I was about 10 years old, I went to Superman the movie with Christopher Reeve. Yes. That made me want to be Superman. <laughs> so you can tell the effects and how people like view their lives about this one made me. It was one of those deals where it, it left an impression on each time, and I thought, I want to do this when I saw dances. And I was overseas in Italy, so I had no contact with the U.S. at all during that time because this is 1990. No right. social media, no computers. You know, it was a phone call at 3 a.m. At, uh, at a pay phone down the street. <laughs> so it was back then. And when I uh, came back and I met Dean, it was 1997, and I took a picture with him. He, he was directing, and his cinematographer, Stephen Winden, is famous now for the Fast and the Furious franchise. And I thought, all these guys, and Stephen Campanelli, his camera operator— He's been Clint Eastwood's camera operator for 10 years. That's crazy. And you don't, I didn't know about any of this stuff because my main area was Dean. And I thought, I want to just soak up everything. Give me, shake your hand. Give me some kind of sure. greatness here because I need something. And it was just wild. Well, I left that because I graduated 20 years later, 20 to 21 years later. Um, Dean is recognized for a lifetime achievement by the ASC in Hollywood, the best of the best in cameramen. I didn't know that. But three years later, I win my first cinematography award from Chandler International Film Festival here in Arizona. It's like a suburb of Phoenix. And I thought, this is wild. So I said, Dean, I'm going to write to Dean and thank him for being such an inspiration to me in my career. Because this is the only one that I had won at the time. I thought, I am so stoked. And it was for a documentary that I did about Irish clogging. Oh, wow. And about four women we did that. And it turned out really well. I was using outdated Canon gear the whole nine yards. And I thought, Dean, I just want to say thank you. Here's a picture of you and I on the set. About a week or two later, Dean calls me three times and I miss every call. Oh, no. oh. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I was out of town one night, didn't know where he was. Didn't know if he was in Australia or L.A. I had no idea. He calls me again and I'm on the road. I can't hear anything. Nothing because you're on the road and you're, it's, it's loud. Sure. So I thought. This guy th probably thinks I'm the biggest jerk in the world for missing this. I was like, what am I going to say to him if he calls me again? I don't want to call him and apologize. I don't, I'm a moron. I'm an idiot. I'm at work. He calls me a third time, and I can't talk because I'm at work. <laughs> so later that night, he calls me, and I didn't even say hi. I just said, Dean, I am so sorry. <laughs> you know, I was groveling like an idiot. But we ended up talking for about an hour and a half about film. And I thought I still couldn't believe it because he talked about these cameras and he talked to me, he joked with me and he basically talked to me like I was his equal. And I am so not <laughs> <laughs> because he is a legend in the Australian community, just a legend. And I thought, Dean, I just wanted to see how much I, you, you, you inspired me. And I didn't ask right. him for a job. I didn't want to do any of the typical stuff that fans do about a person's work. I just said how much of an inspiration you've been. And he said, I'd like to see some of your work. And I, after I woke up, after I fainted, you know, I thought, <laughs> you want to see my work? I, it's not that good. And I thought, well, you don't want to tell him that because you're, you know, you're humble. You don't want to say, I'm the shit. I'm yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but he said he enjoyed it. And we sort of fallen off the last couple of years. But that is something that I remember watching a documentary that he was in. And I think it was a movie he did called Razorback about a giant boar in an Australian town. It was a horror film, terrorizing a horror, like Cujo with a boar. Right, right. right. And, and 
And Steven Spielberg called Dean up and said, hey, great job, love your work. Never had offered him a job, never did that, but it was one of those moments that it was like the phone call of your life. Right. Sure. And that was what I was. And I still try to send Dean my stuff. And he, just like you said, word for word, I sent him my, I don't know what, I don't know how many awards it was afterwards. He goes, Paul, you're going to get a, uh, you're gonna have to get a room in your house just for your awards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only, if only, but sometimes it's, it's, it's very humbling. It's honoring as all get out because I'm a one man band. I'm doing this all by myself mm -hmm. and it's low budget stuff. You want to make it look, it's like, you have a Honda budget, but you want to make it look like a Lamborghini. Sure. Right. Because you really want that quality. And not a lot of people get it, but you do. But now it's like every time I'm applying for work, it's like I'm overqualified for everything. I'll never get a job because <laughs> they think all your awards are thinking to myself. We can't pay you a million bucks a year. It's like I'm asking I'm asking for twenty five an hour or right. whatever. You know, and they say, no, you don't want that. And I thought, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's sort of a double edged sword because. I never like to be satisfied. To me, there's you can always be better. Right. Exactly. And with that uh, ad that I recently did, um, it was for a uh, firing range in my hometown, and I thought they wanted me to follow the actress. Hey, she, not, she wasn't an actress. She was a staff member, but she looked pretty good on camera, and I thought, great, let's use her. So I basically followed her around on a gimbal with my DSLR camera, and I thought, I know what I want to do. I want to follow you around to each room, and you introduce each room, and then I'll just speed you up as you walk. Had it in my head, and it worked out fine. And I thought I'm going to show this to a producer that I know in Florida because she contacted me about DPing and editing some films in Florida. And I thought, great, let's let's do it. But because of COVID and all this other stuff, we have to wait. Sure. So I thought I'm going to send this into a film festival just because. And then I ended up winning uh, best ad this morning, or I, I think this morning, I think. Yeah. Best ad, ad best ad, and it was in it was in Newark, New Jersey. Wow. And I thought I really don't care where it is. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> It's, just it's add it so to the brain, pile. But yeah, and it was just wild because I uh, did my first documentary feature film last year about an oil company out of uh, Williston, North Dakota. And a lot of people know, um, like oil booms of Texas, they know oil booms of certain areas like Oklahoma. We had a major oil boom in North Dakota 10 years ago, right when the recession was hitting in 2008, 2009. They discovered oil or were, were drilling it again, and Williston boomed as another big oil town. Tons of documentaries were being made. People were moving there for all sorts of, you know, different states from California to New York just to find work. Right. It was crazy. And I did this uh, um, documentary. It took me about eight months to do. And it was, uh, I think, four states, 28 interviews. And they said, we need to get this down from, say, 110 to 25 minutes. And I thought, that's not going to happen because you're the whole story is all these stories of the staff and so forth. Right. We got it down and they loved it. I thought, I'm going to send this into a film festival, maybe two of them, New York film, no, New York film awards and LA film awards. Now that I just want to see, cause I think it's good, but it's so hard to be objective when it's your own stuff. Right. Right. Cause I thought, I still see the flaws. I still know what I could have done better. And then, then I ended up winning best director, honorable mention from the New York film awards. Wow. wow. And then, Best Cinematography nomination from the LA Film Awards and a bunch of certificates of achievement. And I thought, okay, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> so yeah, it sounds like it's it. just it's really been amazing because you get to do what you love doing. But um, the last uh, documentary I did was about the COVID. Yeah, because I when the COVID to ask was you going, about that. Yeah, please, please. Well, just just oh. about it in itself, COVID nineteen and the Magic City, which is kind of, from what I understand, like a mini doc taking a look at how uh, the pandemic has affected like small businesses, small towns, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I want to say late February or early March of this past year, I was kind of going around trying to find stuff to do. It, things were slowing down, and I was really joking with a bunch of people because I thought the media, and I used to work as a news photographer. And I really didn't like it because it seemed like news was changing from facts to all no opinion or sensational, whatever. It just didn't seem like it was the same that I, I had known growing up because it's all political and et cetera. And I just didn't want to be involved in that. But I looked around and I was kind of joking with people saying, you know, this COVID thing, it's not a big deal. The media is sensationalizing it, blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, conversations that you have. And I was at a truck stop that my father used to have as a client. And it's a, one of his favorite places because he loved it. The food is great, service, and he knew the owner for like 20 years. So that's what that, that was my father's go-to place. And I went in there, and sections were being closed off. 
Yeah. And anytime I see, you know, sections closed off, they're in a re either renovating or cleaning. Well, these were major areas. And I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. Something's odd about this. I go back the next time and businesses were still being done, but all the waitresses were just sitting around doing nothing. There was like six or seven of them. And they were bored out of their minds. And I thought, so what is going on here? Because we kept hearing in L.A., New York, but flyover country, like, you know, like the middle part right. of the country, they there, there never gets news except if it's weather or something else. And I looked around and I thought, man, this looks like a sci-fi film. Yeah. And a bulb went off, but the bulb wasn't clear yet. And I thought, yeah, let me just let me just go, because when you're isolated and sedentary, your mind isn't really going. It's kind of like you're, you're in that blah mood. Right. I was on a filmmaking website, and one of the uh, um, comments was, I'm a cinematographer, and during COVID, and I'm bored. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, then why don't you make a freaking movie about it? And I thought, <laughs> right. why don't I freaking make a movie about it? <laughs> right. you know? So I thought, this would be great. It's like, what do you want it to be about? I thought, well, why don't we have two like a narrative where two people are talking about COVID? And I thought, well, I don't know two actors here that could do it, because they all left. Because there's no, there, it was wintertime, and nobody was around. They either left or doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I thought... I've done documentaries before. I did a documentary last year, and I did the I did the Magic City Magic Tap Cloggers. Why don't we do a story? And I thought, great. And then I saw the coronavirus, and I thought, why don't we do it about the coronavirus versus? And I, as I was looking around, I saw a lot of businesses then start doing the takeout only policy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought, yeah, but every place I looked at looked like a big empty to me. And I thought coronavirus versus the big empty. And I thought, wait a minute, that's not going to make any sense because Minot is not a big town. It's sort of deceiving. But it's that metaphor, like a small town with a small place. It looks like a big empty because nobody's there. Right. And I thought, let's do it about the Magic City because my hometown, Minot, is nicknamed the Magic City because years ago when the railroad came through, all, the, all these uh, camps, kind of like the mining camps of the west or the east, all these camps started to break up because of the railroad. And magically overnight, the city was born. So I thought, coronavirus versus the magic city, the big empty. And that's way too long of a title. Just take off the big empty and you got it. Boom. So I just rolled with it. And I went around and I thought, I need to get a bunch of businesses together, but I want to do, I want to start it off by national, because I've seen ads, I think Peter Berg did one movie and I loved his work on uh, Deepwater Horizon. It's one of, my, one of my favorite films I've seen. But, in, but if you've watched movies and they have like news reports and they have fast action montage of video and they have people talking about news and all that stuff that's happening now, I thought that's what I need to start this off with. So let me start it up with national news and then go to local news, but in just short sound bites from New York to China to North Dakota. And I did that in sound bites and I just put up the title on each one about what the movie's going to be about. And I thought, hey, this is good. We're getting rolled. We just have to time it right. And then I said, I want to get about a bunch of different businesses to be involved in this. And I want to do um, very different businesses, not the same ones. I don't want to go to McDonald's. Right, I right. don't want to go to chain stores. I want to do local places because they like it more. So I had a educa like a children's music. I had a restaurant, a fitness outfit, a tourism board, mm. and a firearms dealer, which is the one mm. I won the award for. And I thought, these are great because every one of them is, and then a church, because people may think this is the end of the world, right. et cetera. And I thought, perfect. So I contacted them all up, and I thought, what do you think? And they say, hey, for free, yeah, why not? I yeah. thought, well, you could donate <laughs> to me to have money. But, of course, none of them did. But I thought, that's okay. I'm not asking. If you want to donate, great, because you're getting free publicity. And I'm just – I want to get out there and do something because I'm sick of being at home. Sure. So I went out there and got everything done, and I got each one down to about seven minutes. And I try to, you know, I try to make it shorter because – People may not want to watch a segment about a restaurant who's going through COVID, but I thought at least the local people, because I kind of did it for them. And I thought this just kind of shows the resilience of a small town, because in 2011, my hometown went through a massive flood and about 5,000 people were displaced from their homes. Oh, wow. And the flood could have been stopped because it was out of a, I think it was out of a dam or a reservoir in Canada. And it was an accident that the gate was left open or something. Jeez. I thought, wow, and my and the and my home where I grew up in missed the flood by a foot and a half. Wow. So <laughs> when I did this, I thought I want to talk about COVID because where that was a natural disaster, and we have blizzards up there, this is more of a government-controlled disaster. How do they differ, hmm. and how do you? And because this is 2020, 
and I was talking with a buddy of mine uh, who lives in Tioga, and Tioga is a small town northwest of us, and they were feeling the feeling all the success from the oil field because they were kind of in the hub of it. And we were talking about doing a documentary called Tioga, our 2020 vision of the future, because there was tons of expansion up there. And I thought, let's kind of use that and say, since this is 2020 and COVID, how clearly do you see this disaster ahead of you? Are you depressed? Are you pissed off? Are you optimistic? And every one of them was so optimistic because that's the resilience of the small town. I thought, let's talk a little of the COVID, but a lot about the positiveness that they'll see rather than seeing some hokey farmer someplace talking in a really weird Norwegian accent and then being made fun of. Right. right. I don't want that. I want to make it good because um, I wanted to make my hometown look good, but unfortunately I just couldn't make a living there. Right. And I still right. can't to this day because there's just no work, but I thought at least this will be kind of like my love letter to them as to how resilient the community is. Right. So that's kind of how it came out, and I was just surprised it did what it did. It, it's cool how, how uh, film can do that. I mean, you know, when you when you look at it on a surface level, you know, it's like, OK, how this, you know, affect and probably screwed over a bunch of people. But, you know, at the end of it, you know, the message wasn't just about look at what COVID's done. It's about the resilience of the people working together in sure, this community. Sure. It's it's a yeah. cool message. That's really awesome, man. I really uh, enjoyed it. And it was interesting because one of the things a bunch of my family live here in Arizona and um I was uh, contacted, I think, by another guy here in town. I won't mention his name, but I still want to be able to st- – I haven't met him yet. But uh, I was uh, looking – I was trying to contact all these people down here, let them know I'm coming down. And um, I looked on – I don't know where it was, but it was some Arizona film Facebook page. And I looked at it, and I thought – this is a couple, of years, a couple of months after my film came out. And there was a screenshot because a local NBC station did a little video on me saying, local filmmaker does this. They put it at noon, of course, and so nobody saw it. I thought, put it at six. People <laughs> see it. I want to see it. But I was so happy that they gave me some publicity. And I, somebody down here made the exact same film called Coronavirus versus Arizona. Are you serious? And there was a screenshot, and it was almost the exact same wording. There was Mine was the resilience of my hometown is that they'll no, nothing will stop them. Something like that with my face, with a little saying from my interview. And it was basically the same thing with no picture, but resilience of the Arizona community. I thought, really? really? Seriously? Wow. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I was pissed off or flattered. But I thought, I'll go with flattered. I won't be pissed off. Yeah. But I just thought, how, how ironic is that? You know, what an idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they say in this business, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right? So. Yeah. Right. I, just, <laughs> I, I want to be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> my idea. I knew I liked you, and Paul, because I like being pissed off too. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! So yeah. as far as where people like can reach out to you, I have like on Instagram, uh, Paul is Photo Man, and I know right. like when I googled your name, like a bunch of stuff came right up. Uh, is there anywhere specific we should be directing people? You could actually uh, my email address. I've got two emails. I'll give you the one that makes more sense. It's paulisphotoman at yahoo.com. And they could reach me anywhere because I'm here. And I'll give you my website here in a minute. Because one of the things that I've been trying to do is I'm trying to gin up work. But, but of course. But what I'm looking for is full-time work in video. Because when you're new to a location, it's very hard to do freelance work because nobody knows you. Right. And right now I'm competing with guys that are 30 years younger than me who have disposable income. Where the hell they have that, I have no idea. Because <laughs> that was COVID, it's like, uh, what the hell but they have better equipment and better whatever because they have better gear whatever and i thought well i've got all these awards but yet i'm not 20 anymore you know and i thought but i've got years of experience tons of awards and stuff like this but then i think oh, yeah you boys have got an ego and i thought i'm not saying i'm the best i'm not because i'm not but i feel like i've got a little bit more than you do by way of experience so it's it's sort of a humble <laughs> pie on both ends hey i'm credentialed like, all right I'm, I'm not saying yeah. i'm the best <laughs> my spare room is <laughs> well, well my mom my mom told me i was so i just believe there, <laughs> that's the highest of but the high they, right there if they wanted to go i've got a well i've got a wix site if they'd like to look at it because i have two of them actually one is mainly video and the other one is video and still photography because I do pretty much everything but it's paulbreno.wixsite.com mm-hmm. and then backslash I believe it is PB Films and Media the other one is exactly the same thing but it's just PB Films okay and if they want to look that up they are more than welcome to and um, 
my uh, Instagram is at, you know, I think it's at Paul or at Paulus Photo Man and then Facebook. I did change it because I got hacked on Instagram, so I had to start all over again. Ooh. But uh, yeah, it's just they, they started putting a bunch of stuff up that who the hell? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, the chicks are hot. Well, come on, you know. But it yeah. was one of those. It was like one of those adult stupid things, and I thought, please just stop it. If you you've got way too much time on your hands. Yeah. But I think it's Paul Reno, uh, cinematographer, videographer, photographer, or they can just email me, and I'll just email them. It's a lot easier because I'm trying to get the uh, website where it says Paul Reno Films, and I had Squarespace, or no, it was a Squarespace, Square, Squarespace, that website. But unfortunately, it was charging me per month, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't. I was trying to save all the money I possibly could and Wix is free and I thought it doesn't look good but right now because of COVID not a lot of people working I need to do this just for free sure. so I'm trying to yeah I'm trying to put all my awards on there but uh, it was interesting um, I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this because I applied for a job here in Arizona at a government job and it was exactly what I was looking for I thought this is great and then I heard back that they not only hired somebody but the guy told me he says um, about the awards you need to tone them down a little bit <laughs> uh, did I read that thing? Did you did you read me right? It's like I need to tone it down. It's like tone what down? You know, because no. I've got all the gear, every yeah. And I thought, huh? How, so I'm being punished for being good for being Isn't successful. That what you yeah. want? <laughs> you know, this and isn't thought, the first time I've heard this in this industry. We had uh, Neil Ross mm-hmm. on uh, just a, what, about a month ago, and yep. he's, you know, did a lot of the voices of, well, he was in almost every cartoon in the 80s, you know, Transformers, G.I. Yeah. Joe, all that stuff. But he said there was a time where in the industry, you know, having experiencing, having, you know, those names under your belt was working against you. He couldn't, he's like, I couldn't get work to save my life. But yeah. not that that's your, the boat you're in, but I know exactly uh, you know, I, this isn't the first time I've heard this kind of a thing. Yeah, well, it's interesting for me because uh, when I look at, I've never looked at a resume, but I've seen them on, on to either copy them or be inspired by one. It's like, oh, let me do this design or whatever. Sure. Um, I kind of look at it like, if you're being, it's, oh, I'll give an example of this. When I was in Houston, uh, the guy that I worked for, the executive producer I worked for, uh, Frank was an idiot. I don't know how he got his job, <laughs> but the guy just did not have it. And whatever he did have wasn't good because they were trying to produce, I think it was a PSA or a commercial, and they had talent come in. I wasn't there, but one of the guys who had lived in L.A., I got along really well with him and his wife, and he came aboard and he said, just check this check this out. i got to tell you this. We were having lunch. He goes, he actually told an actress she was too good for the part. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that sounds like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a moron. It's like, what do you want, something bad? Or Sorry, do you want we're somebody going who you're subpar on this? It sounds like an excuse yeah, sometimes, yeah. at least yeah. in that case. Yeah. But yeah, like, and somebody asked me too. It's like, well, somebody asked me too. It's like, well, um, what about the uh, baby? They didn't want to pay you enough. It's like it's a government job. The pay is right there. That's why I applied. It's exactly what I was searching for. <laughs> and during the interview, it wasn't him, but it was his partner. Um, I can't remember what her. She was the director of something or PR something, and she said, if you could have any dream job. What would it be? And she stopped me. She goes, other than this job, because they knew I was excited. <laughs> okay, this just sets a person up for complete confusion. Yeah. It's just like, I think you want somebody who, number one, you can control and you don't have to pay as much. But just say it. Don't waste my time. Right. Right. And I was talking to some guy down here, and I have a feeling that Arizona may or may not work. I'm hoping it still does. But the oldest guy on their squad or on their team was 29. So I said, yeah, you want young and cheap. Because you can, because I was like that. I'm 52. It's like, yeah. if you leave, just go. Just leave me alone. <laughs> I don't have time for it anymore. But you're sort of dealing with all that stuff now with age and ageism. And, you know, if you're shooting for like 10 hours a day, um, your back's going to hurt because, well, we can't have that. And, well, get used to it. It's called age. Right. It's called <laughs> you know, the human condition. I'm also be probably going to mess it up that, half as much as your 29 year old. Yeah. And I was having a talk with a guy, too, and he says, yeah, but you, your back was hurting. And I thought, well, yeah, give me some Advil. I'll sit down for five minutes. I'll be fine. And then they looked at the product, and he said, damn, you, you do good work. Uh, but your back. And I thought, you let me worry about my back. Right. You know, that kind of thing. And they really gave like, you that you know, much shit like, about your back? Yeah, because the client complained about it. And I thought, well, the client wanted me to do another video for him. After, after I took a, you know, some Advil, I was fine. 
He says, yeah, but you're back. And I thought, if you were so obsessed about this, don't hire me then. I'll find somewhere else to go. I don't need the confusion. I don't need the frustration because it's not a, not a ton of money, but it's work. I mean, it's one thing if and you're going in most... there with a walker or something, but I mean, yeah, right. gee, man, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. And I've, I've seen so much of it. And I thought, well, good grief. I've had this since I was 20. If you lean, if, can you basically, you know, bend over and vacuum or do the dishes for eight straight hours without a break? Hmm. No. I don't think I don't think a woman could do that, and a woman probably has a stronger back than I do, you know, or anybody does. Shit, here at but forty, I can barely do it once. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really wild to go there. I thought, really, it just made me think a little bit about, hmm, well, maybe if that Wolverine skeleton thing is around, I can go get that. Oh man, that whatever it's called, that adamantium or whatever the hell it's called. So give me that. Be painful, be but going. worth it. <laughs> painful, but worth it. Claws of steel. Don't piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> be held to operate a camera with uh, those fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> You'd maybe get it once, and that'd be it. Well, but we're going to uh, link those websites on uh, our website as well as uh, on our social media and stuff. Make sure people are able to find you and check out those awards. You know what? Don't tone down the awards, Paul. Like, you earned them. You worked for them. Don't listen to that douchebag. Like, <laughs> be proud of them yeah. and put them out there. A lot of times that uh, the people, you, you try to be humble. Right. You try to be confident. But I've met people, uh, you know, I'll tell you this real quick story. I, I lived in Dallas for about a year. This is five years ago. No, six years ago now. And I work with people there. And if, if you've ever known about Dallas or L.A., um, it's called Ego. And everybody has one because it's <laughs> Dallas. And I was working with a guy. And this guy had them. He had such a big ego. I'm surprised he could fit through the door of the, you know, of the work. Right. And he was a he was a part time camera operator. But he thought he was the best thing since God created cameras. Oh. And I looked at his work and his work was shit. But then you told him how bad his work was, and he would leave and pout. Mm. And, that, and this guy was like 42 years old, and I thought, dude, man, I would love to show you my list of credits now, man, and just yeah. make you squirm. It doesn't <laughs> seem like the business to be in when you're that fragile of spirit, too. You know, like, I mean, when you're creating and stuff like that, I mean, you're going to have to you take, gotta some, take criticism. you got to take yeah. some criticism mm -hmm. here and here or there. I mean, it's just part of the package. And if you can't, then, well, you just can't do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the two best testaments that I've ever had uh, growing up was, of course, my family, which are, you know, th you know they, they sort of bring it down to reality. But they say never give up your passion. You may have to do other work while you're doing it. And I may have to do that here. Maybe, I may have to go back to work as a janitor or maybe a desk work just so that income comes in because of COVID and everything else. But uh, Dean and Ken, the guys that I mentioned, when I talked with them, they didn't have an air of, do you know who I am? Mm. Do you know what I could do to your career? It wasn't like that at all. They were very, they were gentlemen. Yeah. And that's the thing that I love so much is their humility. And when you have an Emmy and an Oscar and all this stuff, I thought, holy crap. It's like, I, I never wanted to be a fan, but I kind of am because right. I want the work to be good and I want to be humble. I want my work to have the ego, not me and be the, be like a down to earth guy. And I thought that's what I really learned specifically come from North Dakota, where it's very, it's very humble, very huge. You have to have that humility because everybody there is either a farmer or something else. And when you get into a business where you have egos, you really, really can tell. Yeah. You really can. And both Dean and Ken were so humbling. It was like, man, I want to be like these guys. Because right. these guys, they don't have to tell people they're good. They just know they're good. And people right. know they are good. And right. It's like, that's what I want. So I was told to tame it down on my Facebook page, too, about the awards. And I thought, I've never said I'm the best. I've never said, look at what I did. I just said, I'm honored and very humbled. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I wouldn't I wouldn't tuck those away. Be proud. Weigh well, the awards high. And, uh, you know, I, when you get that new addition on your house for all of them, I want to see pictures, sir. I don't know where the heck I'm going to be. I'm going to be a vagrant for a while. <laughs> I have no idea if someone's going to work out for me or not. I hope it am because I'm talking with a company in uh, Utah right now. And I never thought of Utah, but I thought... If there is a place where I could do what I love doing and keep doing it, bring it on. I may go back to Texas. There's a, a woman there that I've been in touch with, and she I would l absolutely love to not only meet her because we have been texting and so forth, but she's an actress, model, and she's probably one of the most gorgeous women I've ever seen, and I've gotten to know her. And I thought, if I could put some of these people into a film and work with them, man, that would be a dream. And they're sort of egging me on and all this stuff. And I yeah. thought, yeah, but I want to I wanna be humble about it and not say, look what I did. You know, like Stuart on that old uh, Mad TV program. Mad TV. <laughs> Look what I can do. Yeah. Look what I can do. You know, I, thought, I don't want to be like that because the guy that I work with in Dallas, 
did that. He goes, guess what today is? This? Today's my birthday. And oh, that, no. Uh, how old I, you're already oh, off my yeah. list if you're pulling that shit yeah. off. Yeah. Well, he's 43. And I thought, oh, dude, you have no idea how fucked up you are. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but the, the Another reason I like you, Paul. Everybody <laughs> knew he was like that. And they warned me about him. And I thought, I don't like to hear about, I don't like to be set up mm -hmm. to either fail or set up to hate somebody or to dislike somebody. But without even telling me, you've heard about him within the first 30 seconds, he came up to me and he was, I was working with another guy and he was like the senior guy on the squad, on the, on the crew. And he says, I'm going to warn you about this guy. And I thought, Oh, don't do that. But he says, no, no, no. I don't want to talk down to him, but just, this is what he's going to do. And in the first 30 seconds, that's exactly what he did oh, to a T. And I thought you are a, you're a disaster. You know, yeah. and I thought just, and, but he had, he had been at the place for 20 years and I thought, and you haven't been able to increase or excel in your workplace. He's right and where I he thought, wants to be. Something yeah. really wrong with you, you know? So yeah. being around that, but I, it kind of, it, it, I have to say, this guy reminded me of Cliff Clavin on Cheers. <laughs> major, major Burns on MASH and the movie Deliverance. Oh, <laughs> geez. So I thought, that's and a combination a now. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you just wanted to, you wanted to kill him within the first 30 seconds of meeting him. Because <laughs> wow. it's like, dude, the guy had no filter. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, I need to learn from this guy. Learn everything you can from this guy about what you never, ever, ever want to be. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. It yeah, was a great. I never thought yeah. of it like that. Yeah, I just wanted to kill those kind of people. <laughs> but, Why are you looking at me, Jeremy? <laughs> oh, no, 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 because you're the only one sitting here <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> but no. We can't see you if you're beating up now. We just hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it, and I've known uh, people like that. But, um, man. All right, Paul. Well, now. thank you so much for being here, man. And uh, please be reaching out to us in the future. It's been so much fun talking with you, all right? Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been an absolute honor to talk to you, and I hope to uh, do more when I win that Oscar or when I make that million that I have. That'd be nice. Well, I hope you remember us when you have <laughs> yes, that please Oscar. Do. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You're writing my checks tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, what do we have on the website, sir? Go to cannedairpodcast.com where you can see show highlights, guest info, listen to the show, follow us on all our social media, buy some merch, become a patron, see some YouTube videos, and if you'd like to be a guest and promote your work, send us an email on our contacts page. And once again, find us on Twitter at cannedairpod and on Instagram at canned underscore air. And that website Jack was just telling you about contains, uh, you know, the Patreon it's, it's page. It's the one-stop shop for canned air. The merch, everything. Cannedairpodcast.com. There it is. And uh, what else we got, Randy? Just if you're sitting around bored on Tuesdays, join Jack and I and have some fun. And stay tuned at the end of this episode because I'm putting on that Mr. T Treat Your Mother Right song just so everyone knows what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> or at least I was talking about because you guys looked at me just as confused. So, All right, I think that's going to do it for this week. So until next time, I'm Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. I'm Randy Hardenbrook. I'm Paul Bruno, cinematographer. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Paul. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And always remember to be excellent to each other. Mother, there is no other mother so treat her right mother i always love her my mother so treat her right treat her right in me from the moon and the miserable groan from the pain that she felt when i was born always for the oven with the burning heat where she stood making sure i had something to eat Tears for the time that she stayed up at night and took my temperature when I wasn't feeling right. Anxious for the hard-earned money she spent to keep clothes on my back and try to pay the rent. Ears every wrinkle I put on a face and every worry that I caused when I stayed out late. The last letter R is that she taught me respect and for the room up in heaven that I know she'll get. Mother, there is no other like mother, so treat her right. Mother, I always love her. My mother, so treat her right, treat her right. Mother, you own
could break. Whoops. Help. Quickly walk back to the edge. Stop. You'll break through the ice. Snow job. Grab this branch. You should have been listening to canned air. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. Snow job. How'd you get your name? Um. G.I. Joe. This has been a canned air production. 